uh, resolution. We'll go live now to a briefing with acting U.S. Attorney Michael Sherwin and FBI Washington Field Office Assistant Director Stephen Antuno holding a briefing on charges related to the attack last week on the U.S. Capitol. It's just starting. Good afternoon and welcome to the DOJ press conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mark Raimondi. Please go ahead. All right, thank you everybody for joining us today. Sorry we're a few minutes late. We're gonna get started in just about one minute. Um, we're gonna have two speakers today uh, who will make brief remarks and then they'll be followed by a Q&A period. As the operator said, please queue up ahead of time so when we get to the Q&A period, we can go right into it. The speakers today, will be first Assistant Director in Charge of the Washington Field Office of the FBI, Stephen D'Antuano. He'll be followed by Acting U.S. Attorney for the District of Washington, Michael Sherwin. Um, be right back, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Stephen D'Antuano, Assistant Director in Charge of the Washington Field Office of the FBI, and I'm here to provide a quick update on the FBI's activities since the violence and destruction at the Capitol last week. The FBI is quite familiar with large-scale, complex, and fast-moving investigations. We are, we are up to the challenge. As Director Ray says, the FBI does not do easy. To be clear, the brutality the American people watched with shock and disbelief on the 6th will not be tolerated by the FBI. The men and women of the FBI will leave no stone unturned in this investigation. Since these events, the FBI has worked hand in hand with the United States Attorney's Office and our law enforcement partners here in DC and across the country to arrest and charge multiple individuals who took part in the destruction. In six days, we have opened over 160 case files, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. The significance of this investigation is not lost on us. This is a 24-7, full-bore, extensive operation into what happened that day. We cannot do our job without the help of the American people. Since our call for tips, videos, and pictures, we have received more than 100,000 pieces of digital media which is absolutely fantastic. And we are scouring every one for investigative and intelligence leads. We continue to ask for more. If you have information, contact 1-800-CALL-FBI or submit photos and videos to fbi.gov slash US Capitol, and that's capital with an O. I want to stress that the FBI has a long memory and a broad reach. Agents and our partners are on the streets investigating leads, not only here in the DC area, but also across the country through the FBI's 56 field offices. So even, like I've said before, so even if you've left DC, agents from our local field offices will be knocking on your door if we find out that you were part of the criminal activity at the Capitol. But before we do this, this is your opportunity to come forward as several individuals who have, were involved in Wednesday's riots have done to volunteer about their participation. In the weeks leading up to the January 6th rally, the FBI worked internally with every FBI field office to ensure they were looking for, that we were looking for any intelligence that may have developed about potential violence during the rally on January 6th. We developed some intelligence that a number of individuals were planning to travel to the DC area with intentions to cause violence. We immediately shared that information and action was taken as demonstrated by the arrest of Enrique Tario by the Metropolitan Police Department the night before the rally. 
Other individuals were identified in other parts of the country and the travel subsequently disrupted. The FBI receives enormous amounts of information and intelligence, and our job is to determine the credibility and viability of it under the laws and policies that govern FBI investigations. We have to separate the aspirational from the intentional and determine which of the individuals saying despicable things on the internet are just practicing keyboard bravado or they actually have the intent to do harm. In the latter, we work diligently to identify them and prevent them from doing so. As offensive as a statement can be, the FBI cannot open an investigation without a threat of violence or alleged criminal activity. However, when that language does turn to a call of violence or criminal activity, the FBI is able to undertake investigative uh, action. And in this case, we had no indication information was linked to any specific person, but this is a matter of an online discussion. This information was immediately disseminated through a written product and briefed through our command post operations to all levels of law enforcement. Part and parcel of our investigation into violent actors is the fact that we continue to gather intelligence that will aid in our ability to disrupt possible future violent activity. Suffice it to say, we are leveraging our relationships with federal, state, and local law enforcement partners, using our tools at our disposal to find and bring everyone involved in last week's criminal activity to justice. I'm now going to turn it over to Acting U.S. Attorney Michael Sherman. All right, thank you, Steve. Uh, I think I mentioned this before a few days ago that just to begin, I think the scope and scale of this investigation in these cases are really unprecedented, not only in FBI history, but probably DOJ history, in which essentially the Capitol grounds outside and inside are essentially a crime scene, and a scale in which we have literally thousands of potential witnesses and a, a scenario in which we are going to have I believe hundreds of criminal cases, both filed with our local courts, the Superior Court, and through the federal court system. So just to frame things, the enormity of this investigation is, is going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort, and this is not going to be solved overnight. It's not going to be solved within the coming weeks. It's not going to be solved within the coming months. This is going to be a long-term investigation, and rest assured, the Bureau, the Department of Justice, all the U.S. attorneys across the United States that are assisting in these investigations, everyone is in for the long haul. So that being said, let's turn to the numbers that Steve referenced. And the numbers are going to geometrically increase. So as we sit here now, literally days after this event happened, we have already opened 170, more than 170 subject files, meaning these individuals have been identified as potential persons that committed crimes on the Capitol grounds, inside and outside. So of those 170 cases that have already been opened, and I anticipate that's going to grow to the hundreds in the next coming weeks, we've already charged over 70 cases. And again, that number, I suspect, is going to grow into the hundreds. So uh, what are the types of cases we initially charged? And I think there's some misconceptions, and I want to clarify some of those misconceptions, because given the enormity of the actors we saw both inside and outside the Capitol, The range of criminal conduct is really, uh, I think, again, unmatched in any type of scenario that we've seen, the FBI or the DOJ. We're looking at everything from simple trespass to theft of mail to theft of digital devices with inside the Capitol to assault on local officers, federal officers both outside and inside the Capitol to the theft of potential national security information or national defense information to felony murder and even civil rights excessive force investigations. So just the gamut of cases and criminal conduct we're looking at is really mind blowing. And that has really put uh, an enormous amount of work on the plate of the FBI and field office throughout the entire United States. So let's look at those initial cases. And again, I wanna clarify some misconceptions. When criminal conduct occurs, we try to obviously charge people as soon as possible. So the way looking just at the federal system, we'll try to do that via criminal complaint. So when these actors left the Capitol, these individuals, these defendants, obviously the the impetus, the marching orders by federal law enforcement was to find, fix, and charge these individuals as fast as possible. So the prosecutors from the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, we look for 
the most simple charge we could file as quick as possible. So therefore, the initial charges filed in these cases, a lot of them were misdemeanors. They were trespass cases. However, those, those, those cases were opened on those initial charges. We also had several firearms charges. We also had several felony charges that were open with assault and battery, uh, illegal felonious possession of weapons. However, I wanna clarify a misconception. This is only the beginning. So after these criminal charges are filed via criminal complaints, that allows us, that allows law enforcement across the United States to arrest people from Dallas to Arkansas to Nashville to Cleveland to Jacksonville. That's what's happened over the past several days. It's really quite incredible. Uh, now, after those charges are filed, then we have the ability to then indict these individuals on more significant charges, and that's exactly what has happened. For example, yesterday, again, only days after this event happened, we had the grand jury in, in the District of Columbia up. It was booked throughout the entire day, and, and for several hour upon hour, prosecutors in our office presented felony cases, significant felony cases related to civil disorder, related to the possession of destructive devices, related to the possession of semi-automatic weapons that are illegal to possess in the district. So again, I just want to clarify that the initial charges we're filing, these, the, some of these misdemeanors, these are, only, these are only the beginning. This is not the end. So what are we looking at? downstream here. So in terms of what we're looking at is the initial charges everyone's familiar with, the, the zip tie guys, the munchels, and uh, the Brocks that were arrested on, this, on, the, on the house floor with zip ties rifling through the house floor. People are familiar with online, they see the uh, Barnetts and Johnsons who were literally rifling through Pelosi's office and stealing items, stealing materials, mail, and sometimes even personal mementos. So those are the cases the public's familiar with. They're familiar with those cases because of social media. But what the, the public isn't familiar with is that the FBI, working with the U.S. Attorney's offices across the country, and the crux of those being in D.C., we're looking at significant felony cases tied to sedition and conspiracy. Just yesterday, our office organized a strike force of very senior national security prosecutors and public corruption prosecutors. Their only marching orders from me are to build seditious and conspiracy charges related to the most heinous acts that occurred in the Capitol. And these are significant charges that have felonies with uh, prison terms of tw up to 20 years. In addition to that, we're looking and taking a priority with cases in which weapons were involved and cases in which destructive devices were involved. As people know through news reports, there were pipe bombs found outside the Capitol. The ATF is working on that. Metro Police is working on that. FBI is working on that to find that individual or individuals who planted those devices. So in addition to just those rote cases we're looking at, we're gonna focus on the most significant charges as a deterrent because regardless of if it was just a trespass in the Capitol or if someone planted a pipe bomb, you will be charged and you will be found. In addition to that, we've also focused on an emphasis on assaults and batteries on police officers, both, both, both federal officers and local MPD officers that were assaulted. And, and as the days go on, there's gonna be more social media and people will recognize that in some instances, MPD and Capitol Police were in open-handed combat with some of these persons inside the Capitol where tear gas was used on the Capitol Police and federal officers and they were also used against some of these rioters. So the picture is gonna build. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what happened within the Capitol and it's gonna come into laser focus, I think, over the next weeks and days. And I think people are gonna be shocked with some of the egregious contact that happened within the Capitol. The third area emphasis that our office is also focusing on is we set up a strike force to focus on assaults on the media. Some people aren't familiar that some of those rioters specifically targeted members of the media and assaulted them. So we have assigned specific prosecutors in our office to focus on those cases as well. And I'm naming all these different strike forces to just emphasize, regardless of who the victim was, regardless of who the perpetrator was, we're treating all of these cases equally. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchdown phone. If you're using a speaker phone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. 
The first question is from Pete Williams from NBC News. Please go ahead. Hello. Can you clarify for us what intelligence did the FBI gather before the assault on the Capitol about the potential for violence, and what, how did it share it, and did it share it to the Capitol Police? We received a lot of intelligence, like I said in my statement, a lot of intelligence and information through all different means, um, be it through uh, social media or through CHSs, sources. Um, and then we have a sharing mechanism with uh, JTTFs. Across the country, we have uh, Joint Terrorism Task Forces. And in this city, in D.C., we have a very robust J uh, JTTF. And in that, we have Capitol Police, uh, Park Police, MPD, and all the other federal law enforcement partners. We shared intelligence through the JTTF model, and we also shared it through our command post structure, and then also through other means of, of uh, they have access to our information uh, readily available because they have access to our systems. So all that information was shared with our partners, and then we went from there. The next question is from Evan Perez from CNN. Please go ahead. Wondering if you could uh, uh, tell us uh, perhaps if you found any indication so far to indicate that uh, you know there was some level of planning and coordination for for these people to go into the Capitol and carry out this attack uh, rather than just a spontaneous mob that just, that got out of control. And then secondly, if you could, uh, one at least Senator Schumer has talked about the possibility that some people might be put on the no-fly list um, of these 170 case subject files that you've already opened. Uh, can you tell us whether you've added any of those people to a, like a no-fly list as a result of what happened? So um, we're looking at all uh, all different avenues here. So my agents and analysts and all the other FBI personnel in my office and across the country are scrubbing video. We're talking to witnesses. We're talking to individuals that we arrest. And we're gathering that picture, that intelligence, if you will, um, to understand what happened on the 6th that day in the Capitol, outside the Capitol. We talk to all law enforcement partners. And it's not just the FBI doing this. It's all of our law enforcement partners as well that are working in conjunction with uh, uh, Acting U.S. Attorney uh, Mike Sherwin's office and our local office here, too, as well. So we're sharing that intelligence amongst each other. We're putting into the intelligence uh, cycle that the FBI has to, to try to ascertain the, the true picture of what happened that day. As for the no-fly list, uh, we, uh, we look at all tools and techniques that we possibly can use uh, within the FBI, and that is uh, something that we are uh, actively looking at. The next question is from Catherine Herridge from CBS News. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for holding this event. Um, the two pipe bombs that were found at the RNC and the DNC, um, does this cross the threshold to domestic terrorism because they are political targets? And do you think this was designed to either pull first responders away from the scene as the Capitol was breached or an effort to maim lawmakers as they evacuated? So uh, I'll try to address that question for you the best I can. So yes, those two pipe bombs that were found were found both outside the RNC and the DNC uh, offices near the Capitol grounds. and. Uh, Look, to begin, they were real devices. They were they had explosive uh, igniters. They had timers. Uh, we don't know, obviously, exactly why they did not go off. That's being investigated. They were destroyed, disabled by Capitol Police with the assistance of the ATF. And that is all obviously being vetted and investigated. What was the purpose of those devices being planted? Was it a diversionary type of a tactic used by some of these rioters? Was it something, uh, or did it have some other type of nefarious purpose? So that is what the ATF, the FBI, MPD are looking at as we speak right now, and looking for those persons that planted those devices. Uh, in terms of the conduct related to planting those you know, pipe bombs, the, the, you know, the mention of domestic terrorism. I've mentioned this before. I don't like this tyranny of labels saying an act is domestic terrorism. Uh, we have plenty of federal resources at our disposal, plenty of federal charges to address 
all of this conduct from felony murder related to the possession and use of destructive devices uh, to seditious conspiracy, you know, under the federal code that has significant penalties. And as mentioned, uh, with this strike force that was established to focus strictly on sedition charges, we're looking at and treating this just like a significant international counterterrorism or counterintelligence operation. We're looking at everything, money, travel records, uh, looking at disposition, movement, communication records, so no resource related to the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office will, will be unchecked in terms of trying to determine exactly if there was a command and control, how it operated, and how they executed these, uh, these activities. The that, next question is from Pierre Thomas from ABC that. News. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, are you looking at the possibility that some of these suspects were attempting or planning to take members of Congress hostage? Um, so I, I want to um, talk about Mike's uh, the prior question first, just because I want to emphasize um, that we have a fifty thousand dollar reward out uh, for the information, any information and, uh, and uh, identification of the individual or individuals that left the pipe bomb. So I just want to make that perfectly clear, and that we're looking at all angles in that. Uh, every tool, every rock is being unturned because we have to bring that person to justice or people to justice. Um, so the the, the 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 can you repeat the question please no okay are you looking at the possibility that some of these suspects who breached the capitol who had zip yes. ties and other things were looking at the possibility of taking members of con congress or others hostage so like i answered the the last couple of questions before we are looking at all angles here we're, we're we're looking we're interviewing everyone interviewing witnesses and interviewing subjects as they get arrested around the country and within the district as well uh to ascertain the true purpose um of some of these individuals in the capitol that day The next question is from Jake Gibson from Fox News. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, first of all. Uh, I have two, actually. Number one, uh, Senator Cassidy has tweeted out a photo that he said was of an individual that uh, authorities wanted to, uh, to get in contact with in connection possibly with the uh, killing of uh, Capitol Police Officer Sicknick. Number one, can you give us any type of update on that uh, situation. Number two, I know you talked about intelligence leading up to the day before or, or leading up to the day of the riots, but there are some specific reports out that there was a, you know, at least one report out of FBI in Norfolk that painted a pretty grim picture. Um, can you confirm that? And, and were, were authorities on the Hill, uh, you know, really ready for what was coming at them? So the the, the investigation to uh, Officer Sicknick's um, uh, passing is, is an ongoing investigation. We are looking at everything uh, that we possibly can. It, it, is, it cuts us to the core that one of our law enforcement brethren uh, passed away. Um, so we're, it's an ongoing investigation. There's a lot of tools and, and interviews that we're still conducting. There's, there's a whole host of video that's out there. Uh, we're reviewing all that information. Um, as for the information that, that's being uh, presented out there uh, right now about Norfolk, um, that was a thread on a message board um, that was not attributable, was being attributable to an individual person. We, like I said in my statement, we deal in specifics and facts. Um, that information, when my office and uh, Washington Field Office received that information, we um, briefed that within 40 minutes to our um, law enforcement partners, our federal, state, and law enforcement partners that we had on our command post. It got ingested into the JTTF system uh, and was, again, shared with all our law enforcement partners through that process that we have. Um, and that's, that's the action that we took on that. Um, and that's it. This concludes our question and answer session, as well as the conference. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect. And that news conference from